thanks for uh, again thanks Nuno. thanks for very, the very kind invitation and thanks for your hospitality since uh, last night and it's a pleasure to come to your campus and so I know some of you uh, fairly well and it is a pleasure for me to get to know uh, many other of you in my visit so this talk is about uh, quantization and control and it's a, it, it combines ideas and tools from information theory, control theory, and probability theory. And rather than uh, giving a uh, technical, uh, detailed uh, talk, I decided to give a, a more uh, basically uh, sufficient uh, technicality, but at the same time to try to give a, a significant motivations as to why such problems are important so that graduate students in the audience can hopefully uh, receive a fairly uh, complete picture of what uh, can be done, what hasn't been done, and what can be done in the, in the future. And hopefully we can uh, discuss more uh, towards the end of the talk uh, some parts which I did not uh, include in, in the talk today. So basically quantization, uh, as we all know, arises in many different contexts. In, uh, especially in signal processing, we know how quantization is so powerful. In information theory, the heart of, at the heart of information theory is the problem of source coding, which is uh, the idea of compressing data with the smallest uh, number of bits with the uh, highest uh, performance uh, uh, available, which will be discussed later. But increasingly so in control systems, quantization is also becoming commonplace. So quantization is the operation of mapping a large uh, set, possibly uncountable, to a smaller set, typically finite. Now quantization arises in network control and in stochastic control in uh, two primary contexts, at least in the context of what we have been working on. In the context of informational con uh, constraints, in the sense of trying to minimize uh, data transmission, among the components of a network control system, where the goal is to try to uh, minimize some cost function or allow for some stabilization in some sense. And th this might be different uh, criteria. But the idea is to try to basically design a system, design the encoding and coding schemes, pol uh, encoding and control uh, policies, so as to achieve some overall objective with minimum information rate uh, that the system can support. But also in stochastic control, quantization can also be used as a tool to try to approximate an otherwise infinite dimensional problem. And the question, is, the question that we are after in this talk is, can we basically uh, come up with information theoretic ideas to try to handle the second problem, as well as use information theoretic ideas and principles together with stochastic to uh, control theoretic ones to answer some questions in the first part. Okay. So we can categorize these problems in two uh, forms. One is about quantization for network control, and this can be basically quantization for stabilization, and quantization for cost minimization. And the other problem is the, uh, the problem for uh, building on information theoretic ideas to try to obtain approximate uh, finite models and to show that the finite models are in some sense uh, optimal in the sense that the performance that we achieve by solving a finite dimensional uh, Markov decision pro uh, problem approaches to the solution of the infinite dimensional problem in an information theoretically tight sense. So we'll talk about those problems, uh, this problem in detail. And our focus will not be stabilization, but our focus will be basically what I summarized as problem 1b and problem, uh, problem 2. Okay. Now, what's a controlled stochastic system? Um, at, at the University of Maryland, you are, uh, you are blessed with uh, such a powerhouse in uh, researchers for in, in stochastic control. So I'm, I'm sure many, many of you have already seen such uh, slides. But nonetheless, let me just quickly go over an overview. Uh, so suppose you have a, a control system where x is the state, u is the action, w is some independent noise process. And this summarizes the evolution in your system. And suppose that you have a controller who measures the state through a measurement uh, process or you can view this as an information channel where for every x you have a probabilistic uh, outcome at the output y and the controller only observes what he has seen uh, thus far and what he has applied until that time and the idea is to try to come up with a control action using what the controller knows. So in stochastic control in a classical setup that you see for example in a graduate level course the second channel is given to you and you are given a cost function and you want to come up with the best selection for this gamma sub t's to minimize some cost function or to achieve some stabilization criteria. Okay. But in network control, the problem becomes uh, a bit more, more, more difficult because in this case, this ch parameter, this channel, is also subject to design. Basically, you're also designing the second channels. So in a way, you can think of this as a, a forward channel and a feedback channel. In the forward channel, you are designing the information transmission from the uh, encoder or from the like, sensor who sees this plant data to a controller. 
you might have a noisy channel, you might have feedback, you might not have feedback, you might have different basic formulations here. Your channel might, might be a, a quantized channel, discrete noise channel, or it can be a channel with memory. It can be a Gaussian channel, you can basically have uh, all kinds of uh, stochastic kernels here that you uh, want to include in your system, given the physical constraints. And also you also have to come up with, Question. yes? Right after the Q prime, would you, in a, in a, in a conventional sense, imagine also including things like zero order hold or other things that are dictated by sampling that consideration. That's right. Basically, you can, you can, uh, it can be part of the channels. For example, if, if, they're, if they're not designed, it will be part of your uh, conditional kernels. Basically, channel is basically a kernel from X process to Q prime process. You have control over the X process to the Q process, but the channel dictates from Q to Q prime. If there's an inherent, let's say, sampled data system there, this is also going to be part of the system, physical system. But if there is if there is a design for that part also, then you can embed it into the controller. And you also have to basically design both the encoder and the controller. Okay. Now for stochastic stabilization, basically, even though I won't talk about this problem uh, today, because uh, it will be too much to include uh, such such a uh, rich topic, uh, the idea is that basically, given the stochastic system, uh, and given this big picture, big which depicts really at the, the heart of the problem. The problem is the following. Given a channel, given a physical channel, and given a dynamical system, can we design optimal encoding and control policies which will lead to the stabilization of the system in a number of criteria. For example, it can be, I want to keep the state bounded. We want to make sure that the closed loop system, the state is self-process, the state process itself is going to be stationary in some sense. Or we might have some finite moments. For example, we want to ensure that there is the state process at finite second moment. Uh, or of any moment of arbitrary order, uh, then can we basically establish uh, encoding and co control policies where these are, these are possible? So much work has been done on this problem, including uh, research done at Queens, including uh, research by uh, our good friend Professor Martins here. And uh, but some challenging problems remain open, and there are uh, very interesting uh, topics which uh, require further research. But we won't be talking about this today. But the, the, the graduate students, if you're interested, we can talk about this more later in the afternoon, about uh, what some possible directions may be. But in today's talk, basically, we'll be focusing on uh, two aspects. Uh, one is about, basically, quantization for cost minimization, and the other will be quantization for approximate optimality of finite models. And they are very much related problems, and we'll see the connection uh, towards the end of the talk. The, the problem is as follows, again, let's uh, uh, summarize. So given a cost function, so say we have a it can be finite horizon, it can be infinite horizon, but for the sake of presentation, I just discussed the finite horizon in this particular slide. So we have a C is a cost function that we want to minimize. X is the state, use the action. So we get X is the state and use the action of the controller. But the controller has access to the state only through the channel outputs. Okay. And the goal is Q represents the, ch the ch channel input policy or the encoding policy. And pi represents the controller policy. And the question is, we want to minimize this cost function subject to a given physical channel, given uh, the presence of feedback possibly, uh, in, a, in a simultaneous fashion. Basically, it's a joint optimization problem between an encoder and the controller. Okay. So now let's uh, to talk about this problem in further detail. Suppose that we have a, our first process is x-valued, where x can be a, 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 a real-valued process, even though everything that we discussed in this talk can be generalized for any X, which is a complete separable metric space. But Euclidean spaces uh, are sufficiently difficult and are, they are uh, equivalent to more general spaces. So we'll just keep the discussion for the Euclidean um, finite dimensional uh, uh, real vector spaces. And we have a, uh, first we'll talk about the noiseless channel. Suppose our noiseless channel, for example, here we have a channel. First we'll talk about the case where the channel is noiseless. And we have an encoder, and encoder at any given time it has to be causal. Basically, at any given time, it only can use the past received data to the encoder, and it will, uh, the encoder maps what he knows to the set of channel inputs, which is a finite set. And the decoder receives uh, the finite channel and come up, comes up with a controller, with a control action, and the system evolves. Okay. So basically, again, look at the picture again. Um, okay, I believe this. We lost power here, it seems. Yeah. 
Is another one? Okay. okay, I can use this. Just battery. So basically, yeah, if you look at the previous slide, uh, the, the problem is basically uh, we have to optimize both the encoder and the controller with the information structure detailed here. So you might think of a finite horizon cost problem. In this case, you have a finite uh, horizon t, and you want to minimize this cost function. But you might also think of an infinite horizon problem. In this case, you take the normalized costs and take the limit supremum of, the, of those costs. And the goal is basically to try to minimize. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Minimize the, the, the cost function uh, for an infinite horizon problem, subject to the information constraints that are imposed by the by the system. Now, those, those of you who are familiar with the information theory, you will see that this problem has a lot of uh, relevance to information theory uh, problems. In particular, uh, one of the uh, foundational problems in information theory is the source coding problem. In the source coding problem, the setting is as follows. We have a collection of random variables. And the, the idea is to try to arrive at a sequence of, construct a sequence of encoders, which will map the sequence of uh, random variables to a finite set. And the cardinality of the finite set for every fixed n is fixed by 2 to the rn, where r is the rate of the encoder. And here, a decoder, which maps this finite set to the set of reconstruction values. And the objective is to try to minimize the expected value of this cost function. So there should be an expectation here. And we say that an rd pair is achievable if there is a sequence of encoders and decoders, so that this holds. So it's an asymptotic uh, definition of uh, operational uh, uh, rate distortion function. And uh, we say that basically for a given for a given d, the infimum r for which r d is achievable, we, we call this the rate distortion function. For example, for if you have Gaussian source with variance sigma x square, then if I want to achieve an average distortion of d, I need on average for every uh, for every sample on average we need one half log two of sigma x square over d bits. But this problem is. Uh, it's very important and it's very useful. It has led to revolutionary uh, discoveries in uh, uh, communication theory. It's not applicable to our setups, uh, mainly because uh, in our case, the encoding is causal. For example, in the rate distortion setup, the, the input to the channel can be a function of the entire block length. Because you have a block encoding, whereas in our setup, we can only use causal uh, processing. We can only map what is available until time t. And uh, basically, many uh, systems which are delay sensitive, when it, when it, many uh, applications which are, which are delay sensitive, including network control, does not allow for such a uh, such a setup, especially when T is unbounded. And furthermore, many practical systems that we use in uh, in uh, uh, our everyday everyday applications, they really do not allow for uh, such uh, long delays uh, for to, to be able to directly apply registration theoretic ideas. Okay. And there's a long literature review uh, on, on what we call uh, real-time coding. And I'd like to basically uh, particularly mention these two papers, and I'll talk about this in further detail. But there are different setups, different inter interpretations of what we mean by real-time coding. Some authors, for example, talk about uh, real-time entropy coding, basically which allow for uh, 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 non-causality in the entropy coding part of the system. And the paper by Neuhoff and Gilbert set up, discuss such a, such a setup. And Linder and Zamir, for example, also talk about a, a stationary source in the asymptotic rate. You also have the, the school which discusses the non-stochastic sources, basically individual sequence type sources. And again, uh, uh, researchers have studied such problems. But in our context, we are going to be uh, discussing the setup which we just formalized. And we will call this as the zero delay coding problem. And uh, there are, again, many different uh, setups studied in the field. And uh, another paper which is very important, uh, which has been an inspiration for our research, is the paper by uh, Walker, Mitri, and Tatikonda, uh, where they, they also discuss a, a, a zero delay coding problem. Okay. And finally, you also have some existence results in, in, the, in the literature. And finally, you also have results on uh, stochastic stability of coding schemes, where the goal is not optimization, but the goal is to make sure that given a source and given an encoding scheme, to try to make sure that the source process and the encoding process itself, uh, as a joint process, lead to a stochastically stable process. Okay. And John Kiefer has uh, many contributions on, on, on this problem. Okay. Now, as, as I mentioned, two very foundational references are the papers by Wissenhausen and Warren and Varela. And uh, in our contribution, we, we extended this to the, the case where the source values are, are uh, not, not finite, but uh, real valued or possibly uh, partially absorbed real value sources. 
And this announcement result says the following, which is a very important uh, uh, result, which I'll be, discuss, uh, I'll be discussing further as to why this is very important. And this announcement sa says the following. So given an encoding policy, and given a decoding policy, if you just keep the decoding policy fixed, and, but replace the encoding policy with one which only uses, which only uses the current source symbol and the data at the receiver, uh, that's going to be no worse than the original coding policy. So because given an encoding decoding policy, keep the decoding policy unaltered, don't change it. Replace the encoding policy, which was using the entire uh, uh, past state values, but ignore the past state values, just keep the current state and the information at the receiver. This is going to be at least as good as this policy. And Warren and Raya further adds to the result, and they say that now optimize also the receiver. Okay. And they say the following, for the finite version problem, any encoding policy and decoder policy can be replaced with one which only uses the conditional information as seen by the receiver on the encoder. So like in, in, Warren and, in, so in Wissenhausen, Wissenhausen uh, says that basically uh, uh, just uh, hold on to the information at the receiver, whereas Warren and uh, further refines this and they say that basically replace QT minus 1 with the conditional probability that the decoder thinks about the encoder state. Okay. Like in our in Warren Ray setup, any encoder, an optimal encoder, if without any loss over the class of all causal encoding policies, is going to be using the conditional information as seen by the receiver on the current state and the current state of the source. Okay. This result is very useful because a, a control theorist, when he sees this result, he immediately recognizes that here we have a fixed state space. Basically, pi sub t belongs to, the, belongs to the space of probability measures. It's a large space with a fixed state space. It does not grow with time, which means that we can talk about a number of very useful results. One is the following. For me, if the source is IID, then an optimal encoder is going to be memoryless. So an information theorist, for example, uh, will be surprised to see this result possibly because even when the source is IID, if you allow for block encoding, memoryless encoding is not optimal because block encoding strictly outperforms uh, memoryless encoding. But if you cannot look at the future, basically the past is also useless. You can, only, uh, you can just use memory of coding policies. You can talk about the stationarity of a coding policy. In information theory, basically, you always talk about, in the construction, in the typical constructions, you talk about increasing block lengths, and you talk about asymptotic ideas in trying to basically uh, obtain uh, rate distortion achieving, for example, sequence of encoders. Whereas here you have to talk about a stationary encoding scheme. So in a way, it's, it's related to what in information theory, uh, we, we, we talk about sliding block codes, uh, and such arguments, but here there's a claim of optimality also. And also you can uh, apply these results uh, to also limited delay problems, where basically uh, we don't have to have a zero delay coding problem, but we can allow for a fixed finite delay by increasing the size of the, the order of the Markov source. And finally, and more importantly for our talk, basically we can use tools from stochastic control to obtain approximation existence, but mainly existence result in itself is not going to be interesting, but using existence we can obtain approximation results okay. by defining a proper metric to define on the space of uh, encoders, we can basically obtain useful approximation results. Okay. Now, what's the stochastic control formulation here? Basically, uh, again, as we d discussed, a quantizer is a mapping from RD in, for this talk to uh, a finite set, and let Q denote the set of all quantizers. And any uh, encoder which we just uh, uh, discussed to be optimal, uh, basically can be viewed as follows. For every pi, we pick a quantizer Q which maps RD to M. So you now, as you see, control theoretically speaking, there's an interesting uh, aspect here because we have to now think about the set of all possible maps which maps the Euclidean space to the uh, finite uh, range, to a finite set. And so we haven't yet specified uh, what class of functions are allowed here. But if, if you can, as you can see, this is an infinite dimensional space. But for every pi, the encoder is going to pick one such map. And then we, then we define a quantization policy to be a policy which maps the set of probability measures phi sub t to the set of such maps. So we, then our, our state space is going to be the following. The state is the set of probability measures phi sub t on the state, on the original state. Uh, and as you see, pi sub t is basically the conditional distribution as we uh, talked earlier. So pi sub t is the 
conditional distribution as seen by the controller on the state. And the controller picks the action which maps the state itself to the finite set. Okay. And now given this discussion, basically we have a, a filtering equation which governs the uh, evolution of the conditional distribution. It just follows from uh, the, the uh, bias formula. And basically given, given the previous conditional kernel, the conditional density, uh, your evolution of the Markovian source and your encoding policy, this uniquely identifies the probability measure for the next time stage. And then you write down the, using a filtering equation, you obtain uh, the conditional distribution for the next time stage. And what you realize is that then we have a control Markov process now. Basically, you can show that uh, with this formulation, the pi t process and qt process becomes a control Markov process, where q is the q-valued process. But we haven't yet defined what this q is. As defined, q is just a set. We haven't put a metric on the space, uh, we haven't put a topology on the space. Without that, it, it will, it's going to be ill-post. So now we have to do some more work to try to put a proper, uh, uh, define this space properly. But sorry, what is the QT process? The QT process is the is the selection of this function. Ah, okay. So QT is, the, is, the, is at time t, for example, yeah. I decide to, for example, let's say, map the positive numbers to 1, negative numbers to minus 1. So this this uh, realization of a Q process. So in particular, it includes the trivial process, which makes a constant selection. That's right, yes. Even yeah. then, it's not... Uh, even even then, it's not a, uh, uh, it's not uninteresting, right? I mean, it's an interesting optimization problem of the kind that uh, we do in several processes. Right, but information theoretically speaking, if you send only one data, uh, basically that amounts to sending uh, no information, because the the controller is intelligent. The controller says, but you need at least one bit to make a uh, information transmission. If the range of this is 1, log 2 of 1 is 0, it means there is no information transmission. Now, I meant really if the set of all quantizers right. is a single one. That's what I meant. Uh, In other words, then it's a, in the QT process, it takes a constant value. This is right, so uh, your question is, is oh, okay. legitimate in the sense that uh, what you are basically saying that I map to a single point, but there are infinitely many such single points. Yeah. That is true. But if you have an intelligent decoder, for him, if he knows what the constant is, sending zero or sending uh, two is irrelevant because you only receive one. You receive no data. The cardinality log two of m is zero. But, you, you, but if you consider your decoding process as part of the quantizer. Then, you, then your question is uh, uh, very appropriate. Yeah. Okay. So basically, then we have a process where we have a set of probability measures that represents uh, the actual state, and a set of quantizers uh, denotes the set of actions. Okay. And then we have a cost function, and we basically then we have our cost function as follows: the cost function for a given pi and for a given q is given by. So this is the conditional density. This is the original cost function. So as you see, this is C0, this is C. So these are different cost functions, but the idea is that in, my new, in the new formulation, the cost function is given by this average, and we, uh, this ex expression becomes the effective new cost function. And now, basically, uh, uh, we are now trying to put a proper topology on the set of, set of quantizers, and for this, basically, we are going to put an assumption, and we will only allow for quantizers which have convex cost cells. Now, we need this basically, uh, without this convex causal assumption, we can show that the set of quantizers will not be a closed set in the uh, setup that we'll be discussing. So basically, uh, if, I'm if I'm quantizing my d-dimensional Euclidean space, each bin is going to be a convex polytope. From the Voronoi partitions uh, is going to be one example. Almost all the practical systems that we encounter have uh, convex cells. But uh, basically, uh, uh, we don't have a proof for the general setup which claims that, uh, which uh, shows that uh, such a uh, construction is optimal. For a static setup, and if you have a, uh, a Euclidean metric, quadratic distortion measure, you can show that the optimal encoders are always going to have convex polytops because they follow from Lloyd Max optimality conditions. But whenever you have a dynamic setup, that is uh, not uh, easy to show. Fixed, right? M is fixed. Uh, no, M is fixed. For every time stage, M is fixed. M is fixed. That's right, yeah. Okay. 
And note that you, uh, one benefit of having convex constants is that you can characterize the set of all quantizers now by characterizing the hyperplanes which partition the state space. So you can, you can have a finite dimensional characterization of your, of your quantizers. And now here's what we, how we define the set of quantizers, put a proper uh, topology into the space of quantizers. So what we define is basically we view a quantizer as a conditional kernel, which gives the value of 1 when the quantizer in, in that bin, and 0 elsewhere. So we view a quantizer as a conditional probability measure, which is going to give the value of 1 when x is in the bin of the quantizer. Because the bin is the bin of the quantizer, the inverse image of the uh, range. And then we look at the joint probability measure of pi and q, and then we associate with every quantizer a product measure of pi and q. And in particular, what we say is the following. We say that a sequence of quantizers converts to another quantizer at pi if this joint measure goes to pi q. So basically, uh, this allows us to be able to define a, 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 a metric, a, a proper topology on the space of quantizers. Sorry, I missed something. Earlier, your quantizers were fixed mapping. They were not randomized, were they? They're still fixed. They're still fixed. Why do you consider randomized mapping? Uh, because you can show that randomization doesn't help. Doesn't help. Doesn't help. You can show that. But we uh, now, in this case, for example, we view a quantizer as a transition kernel. Yeah. And in fact, uh, what you can show is that the set of quantizers is the set of extreme points of the set of all randomized kernels. But this basically allows us to use, uh, put a proper metric now, because imagine this. All you have is a mapping from Rd to a finite set. How, how would you put a metric on this? You know? it's, it's very hard. Basically, uh, for example, in uh, Borkar Mitri Tatkonda, they use the Hausdorff metric. And uh, that, that has certain limitations. For example, that is, uh, for example, you cannot deal with, for example, when your range is not compact in certain formulations. Whereas here, you use the powerful tools of the set of probability measures. Now, now for example, now we, can, now we can comfortably say that a quantizer converts to another quantizer with this formulation. And now, uh, for our, uh, uh, for the, everything I talk about in this talk, everything applies for finite state-based Markov chains. Provided that finite state Markov chains is a chain is an irreducible one, but uh, things are more interesting when the state space is uh, is not finite. In, fa in fact, in control theory, we very much would like to uh, work with uh, real spaces. So, if you have a real space, basically we have some assumptions for uh, our results to uh, be applicable. But these include uh, the linear system driven by an additive noise process, basically when the noise process admits certain regular, regular, regularity conditions, and in particular, basically we, we want conditions of this form. We want there to be a, uh, the density function to be uh, bounded, but we also want a, want a Lipschitz uh, condition on the on the density process. And uh, this will also come up in the second part of the talk, but uh, we'll try to make the connection there also. Okay. So then, then, given this setup, then we really have uh, the main issue. Because this just wraps up what the discussion. Define S to be the set of all probability uh, measures where probability measure admits a density function. Density function is bounded, and density function is Lipschitz. Then, uh, for every time stage, our density process lives in this set. And for this set, this set is a very special set in the sense that convergence uh, in a weak sense is the same as convergence in, in, a, in a much stronger sense in the variational norm. And then, we, as we discussed, we uh, equip uh, the, the joint space with the product topology on, on this space, the, the product measure on this uh, random, random space. Okay. And, uh, Basically, basically uh, now define pi w as a set of optimal and, and quantization policies, which also have convex constants. And define pi cw to be this process. And here's our, our first result. It says the following. If you have basically a finite dimensional optimization problem, then uh, there exists an optimal quantization policy, an optimal encoding policy for a finite horizon problem. Okay. And the results also apply for the quadratic case, because we were very curious about what happens with the uh, LQG problems. And uh, the results with further conditions also apply for this case. And in particular, you can also uh, discuss the infinite horizon case. And basically, you take the limb soup of the average. And the results also apply for the infinite horizon case. But with the infinite horizon case, also following up on Prakash's uh, question, we have not been able to show that randomization does not help. 
for an infinite problem, you can show that an addition doesn't help, but for an infinite volume problem, it's not clear if an addition doesn't help. But if you allow for randomization, then you can show that there's an optimal policy. And in addition, basically, you can also obtain some engineering uh, intuition using these ideas. For example, if you replace the infimum and the limb sub discussion here, what, what you can show is the following. For every epsilon, there's a finite horizon problem, which is going to be uh, optimal. So for every epsilon, you can, instead of encoding, if, instead of looking at the infinite past, you can just look at the, uh, uh, a finite past, and encode the finite, uh, use the finite past uh, data to come up with a new uh, channel input. This is going to be epsilon optimal. So this is one, one benefit of using a control theoretic formulation. And furthermore, if you in our ICD paper this year, if you can also basically uh, assume certain conditions, for example, if the source is uh, a finite state Markov chain, or if the source is not finite state Markov chain, but it, it achieves certain coupling properties, you can also even obtain the following bound. For every epsilon, you can find a memory which is going to be inversely proportional with epsilon multiplied by uh, basically 1 over epsilon times k, where k is a, what we call a coupling time for Markov chains, which is going to be uh, epsilon optimal. It's a practical result which it, uh, shows us that we can get away with uh, almost optimality by epsilon optimality uh, by using a finite memory encoder. This is different from the range of the quantizer n that you have proposed. Oh, it, uh, that is true, yes, yes, I apologize for that, yeah, this, is, this should be P or T. Yeah. Now, that end, the earlier one, yes. is, it, is it known how your optimal cost decays with increasing N? Uh, we don't have analytical results, no, uh -huh. yeah. In the, in asymptotically, uh, you, uh, yeah, in asymptotically, you, you can, you know the asymptotical uh, area. Basically, asymptotically, they become, uh, asymptotically, the causal coding is at most, uh, as you know, uh, log 2 of pi over 6, uh, 0.25 bits. That's right, yes, of the, of the Gaussian and the variable, right? But for finite, uh, no, we don't have results. Yeah. But as you know, even, even for a scalar Gaussian source, right, if the answer to the question of, let's say, if I have m bits, yeah, sure. even in that case, the problem is very difficult. Because if you go to asymptotics, you can solve it. If you go to infinite dimension in the sense of achieving great distortion. But it's a very, very interesting problem for practical uh, uh, applications, and we do not have uh, results. Okay. And you can apply basically these results to control systems, linear quadratic Gaussian systems. And uh, uh, they apply uh, basically when there's control also. These apply when you have noise feedback. All the structure results apply. Uh, and finally, s similar results also exist in the literature when you have multiple uh, multi-terminal systems. Uh, uh, but for the case where uh, we have a Markovian source, the results uh, are not as as, uh, as, as basically uh, as clean results. Okay. So basically, for, for the multi-terminal case, if you have an IID source and you have multiple encoders here, you can show that an optimal encoder is go uh, an optimal causal encoder is going to be memoryless. You can show that. But when you have a mem source with memory, the separation results no longer hold. And this is an open uh, area of uh, current interest, and uh, both implementation-wise as well as for, for uh, uh, obtaining analytical results. Because this is one direction which uh, the graduate students might be interested in uh, pursuing. Now this was the first part of the talk. It basically, the main uh, the issue was to try to basically uh, design real-time encoders for control systems and for other zero-delay coding applications to try to arrive at uh, optimal policies. And we built on control theoretic ideas to try to obtain not only structured results, but also approximately optimal results and existence results. Now in the second part of the talk, basically, uh, the reason uh, we came up with this second part is the following. We decided to work on the problem where uh, not only the channel between the encoder and the controller is quantized, but also the channel between the controller and the actuator is also quantized. So basically then the problem becomes, what can I do? What is the limitation of having a quantized control action set for the performance of the optimal policy? Okay. And, and um, when we are discussing this problem, it occurred to us that the techniques that we uh, were working for this problem can also be applied for uh, the first problem, which is that if you have an infinite dimensional Markov decision process, stochastic control problem, as you know uh, very well if you've taken a course from Professor Marcus, uh, and even, even basically for, for uh, real, real spaces, for optimal control problems, when you solve hamilton jacobi bellman equation, for example, you have infinite dimensional problems, and obtaining analytical results is, uh, is 
very much impossible. And if you are lucky, you can obtain a verification theorem and you can obtain a solution, but many times it's very hard to arrive at optimal policies. Then the question was, uh, that came to us was that, okay, can we use these ideas to try to approach this problem? And then, of course, we realized that there is lots of problems, lots of people, including Professor Marcus, who have done very interesting work on, on this field. Uh, and luckily, we, didn't, we weren't aware of them when we started working on the problem, because that would have discouraged us. But once we obtained our approaches, then we were able to basically see our, uh, our technique and see the differences, and we were able to uh, properly place uh, the contribution of our approach in this large contribution, which has been uh, provided by, by uh, very important uh, con con contributions. Okay. So basically, let me just uh, summarize the following step. How do we approach the problem? First, we quantize the action space, the, the set of possible actions that we can apply at the actuator. Then we quantize the safe space. Then jointly quantizing the action space in the safe space gives us a finite dimensional Markov decision process. And this finite dimensional Markov decision process can be solved using MATLAB in, in a few seconds. Because we know finite dimensional, uh, finite state Markov decision processes, there are many uh, computational tools, linear programming, uh, post iteration, value iteration, uh, queue learning. So you have lots of uh, tools to try to solve finite state action Markov decision problems, which you do not have for in the infinite dimensional case. And then we try to basically, uh, once, constructing, uh, once we construct a finite dimensional setup, can we obtain how our uh, construction scales as the size of the finite set increases, and can we claim some optimality uh, of the rate of convergence? And again, there are lots of contributions in this field, and uh, it goes back to basically 70s uh, under different setups. But it's a very active area of research, and uh, st still basically you can see many recent uh, contributions uh, for, for these problems. Okay, okay so basically, uh, so what's the Markov decision process? A Markov decision process is basically a stochastic process which evolves as I discussed earlier. Here I just replace uh, x to z uh, for this uh, formulation. So we have uh, v is our noise process, a is the action process, z is the state process, and we are evolving uh, stochastically given uh, f process. And the controller again uh, selects the action using the information available to it. And as I mentioned at the first part of the talk, the goal is either to stabilize the system or optimize the system or allow for performance guarantees. And uh, again, there are many applications for such problems, for example, in queuing theor theory, in networks, uh, in uh, network control, in information theory. Uh, there, there are many problems where we can approach the problem using uh, uh, such a stochastic control theoretic formulation, as I also tried to motivate in the first part of the talk. And of course, the controller's job is to try to arrive at the selection which maps A sub n using the information available to it. Okay. And again, uh, to d discuss basically uh, the set of policies, uh, basically, we say that a policy which is going to be mapping all the information available to the controller to the action set is called an admissible policy. Maybe this is a policy which se selects an action based on everything that he knows until that time. We say Markov policy, which, which is a policy that selects the action only using the current state and th the time information. So it can, be, it can depend on time, it's non-stationary, but it only uses the state. As you see, there's a significant reduction from a computational complexity point of view from going to such a space which keeps ex expanding in the domain of the controller to a fixed state space. And then we say that the policy is stationary, deterministic, if it maps the state to the action in a stationary fashion, in a deterministic fashion. So it's, a, it's a fixed uh, mapping. And typically in control, we are interested in two problems. Uh, discount with cost, basically such cost problems are the ones where you value the near horizon more than the infinite horizon. And the average cost problem is the complete opposite. You do not value the near horizon at all. All you care about is the infinite horizon, the ergodic limit. Okay. And these are different uh, from, uh, practical motivations. Probably in economic applications, typically discount cost is more important because the va value of a dollar today is, more, uh, is higher than the value of a dollar tomorrow. Whereas for many problems, for example, in information theory, we always strive for asymptotic limits. And now we define a, a stationary quantized policy as follows now. Uh, given a stationary policy mapping Z to A, we quantize the range of A in the following sense. Given a policy which maps uh, Z to A, what we do is we map 
uh, so Q, little q is a quantizer here. It maps the state process to the action process, but the action process takes values in a finite set. Okay. So we have just re reduced the cardinality of the action space. Okay. Now, uh, what, we, uh, what we impose on the, our uh, Markov system is going to be uh, very important for obtaining different results. And in particular, uh, the stronger conditions we have, uh, the uh, stronger results we are going to be able to obtain in using our analysis. But the more restrictive uh, the assumptions will be because many applications will not satisfy those assumptions. Therefore, we, we, we try basically we discuss three notions of uh, convergence for uh, the set of probability measures. We say a probability measure converges to another probability measure weakly if this uh, integral converges to the limit integral for every continuous and bounded function g. And we say that a set of probability measures converges to another probability measure setwise if for every set B, in the, uh, for every event, for every Borel set, the, conditional pro the, the measure of that set converges to the measure of the limit, the limit measure on, on the set. And we, we say that uh, the sequence converges in the variational norm, which is a very important norm that we use uh, uh, in both control theory and information theory. It's like in this case, you, you want the convergence to be uniform in all B values. Uh, for example, in information theory, we also have other, other notions. For example, we talk about uh, relative entropy, or the, the kurbach weber divergence. That's an even stronger notion than total variation. In information theory, we also talk about, for example, Wasserstein time distance. And that is some, somewhere between weekly and total, total variation. Maybe you can, you can add, add more ranges to your, uh, to your uh, convergence notions. Uh, and hopefully in this talk we'll see how uh, they can be extended to more general setups. Okay. Now, the remaining part of the talk unfortunately will have lots of assumptions. So that's why I decided to, rather than uh, going into details, I decided to basically give a more general picture here. So you have lots of assumptions and uh, these assumptions mainly are there to try to uh, give us uh, two things. One, to make sure that to make sure that our uh, uh, Markov chain has an invariant distribution. And the invariant distribution satisfies certain regularity properties. And those regularity properties that we achieve for a finite model and an infinite model are sufficiently close to each other. Because these are the three main uh, conditions that we need. But to make those happen, we really have to assume a number of conditions, uh, but which are nonetheless uh, satisfied in uh, many practical applications. Okay. So, uh, so the first result is the following. If we have uh, what we call setwise continuity, basically if for every <coughs> A and X, so, uh, so this is the one stage transition, basically P A given X A is the probability of the next state being in that set A given the current mark of state X and the current action A. So we say that basically this probability is setwise continuous if for every fixed X, if the control actions converge to one another, the conditional probability measure converges setwise. And remember, setwise was this. Okay. So given that condition, we can show that if you have a discount cost problem, for every epsilon, we can find a finite model Markov decision process, which is going to be epsilon optimal. Okay. And the idea is that what you do is you look at the, the set of the infinite uh, product measure on the X process and the A process. And what you show is that, what you show is that as A's, as you increase the cardinality of A's, this joint measure is going to converge to the limit measure. And it's going to allow you to show that uh, your policy is epsilon optimal. Okay. And then you have a similar discussion for average cost. For average cost, you all, almost always look at what happens in the invariant limit. Then the idea is that basically, when you have an average cost problem, when you normalize it by n, take the n to infinity, you have an ergodic uh, expression. This is what we call, uh, in this case, for example, you can think of it as a strong of large numbers, ex ex except that here you have an expectation. Okay. But you look at the uh, ergodic limit, because that specifies the uh, invariant cost that you will achieve. Then the idea is that you want to make sure then, you want to make sure that under some conditions, uh, your ergodic limit is going to converge to a limit, and your cost function converges to a limit, and uh, the integral will also converge. Okay. And make you have a number of conditions. Again, we'll sh sh show examples where these are possible. And for example, here's an example. Suppose you have a, the following setup. If your f function, for example, is continuous and bounded, and if your 
v function is any noise process, and v may not even exist. Then, provided f is continuous, you have v continuity. If f is continuous, and v has a density, and density is continuous, then you have stepwise continuity. And if f is, in addition, Lipschitz in A and X, and V, there's a density which is Lipschitz, as in the Gaussian case, then you have total variation continuity. So you see, we can, we can find conditions for even such a setup to justify uh, the, the results that we have. Okay. And for average cost, basically what you do is, you, for every finite setup, you look at the ergodic average, you look at the cost, and you look for conditions when this limit holds. And, and then you make, you have con there are conditions which are what we call generalized dominated, dominated convergence theorems. They tell us that basically uh, one limit converges to uh, another limit. For example, if these v's were fixed, the dominated convergence theorem will imply this result. But because v also changes, we require a further uh, result, and uh, there are results available in the in the probability literature which allow for uh, such uh, convergence notions. Okay. And uh, I'd like to find out how much time I have. Uh, so you have five, seven to six. Hmm? Okay, I'll maybe take 15, 10, 10, 15 more minutes because uh, I don't want to just bombard you with technicality, but I just want to give, give the, basically the main general feel of uh, what these conditions are. Okay. Now, such results also apply for weak continuity. We can obtain similar conditions, and again, I discussed why when weak continuity holds in this example. And then, basically, uh, for, a finite, uh, for a discount uh, horizon problem, what you always look for is you look for a, a, a u function which satisfies this fixed point equation. We call this the Bellman optimality operator. The optimality operator is known to be a, a, a contraction mapping in the space of all uh, function, measurable functions and bounded functions. And then you try to make a find conditions when this limit exists. And then what we'll do is for every fixed n for the cardinality of the control action space, then uh, you want to see, show that u n goes to u. Okay, this is basically the main outline. Then you can find conditions for when this is going to be the case. And we can obtain conditions for discount cost also. And likewise, okay, for average cost also. Okay. I'll just probably skip these parts. But one thing I want to mention is this. Uh, in, uh, for a Markov decision process, if you do not have access to the state, and you only have access to the state through uh, some measurement data, the typical approach to, is to try to enlarge the safe space very much in the same spirit as we discussed in the first part of the talk, to define a new state, which is a controlled Markov state. But the state is a, the space of probability measures, as seen by the controller on the plant. Right. So this is a typical approach that we do in stochastic controls. Now, a recent finding, for example, by Feinberg, shows that when we reduce the uh, stochastic control problem to a fully observed stochastic control problem, uh, to a, to a probability measure valued, or, or what you call a belief valued control problem, the continuity is almost, uh, sorry, setwise continuity is almost, almost impossible to satisfy. Make it, make it, they find, uh, uh, they, they show that you can obtain conditions for weak continuity, but even, even when you have very strong conditions, such as uh, total variation continuity of the observation channels, uh, weak continuity is going to be uh, satisfied, but even if, for example, let's say you have total variation of the observation channel, but you have uh, setwise continuity of the transition kernel, you will not have uh, stronger notions when you view the space of probability measures at your state space. We have to find ways to deal with, to work with weak continuity. We cannot, uh, we cannot uh, uh, impose a stronger condition uh, for studying such problems. That's why obtaining results for weak continuity is important for such formulations. And in particular, then, using our results for weak continuity, we can obtain the same result. For every epsilon, we can find a finite action space which is going to allow for epsilon optimality. And likewise, we can do the same for average cost. Now, the, remember the outline. The first part was to quantize the action space. The second space is to quantize the state space, the second phase. And then we'll try to combine the action space and the state space to obtain our final finite model. And then, uh, first, for the state space, we first discussed the case where we quantize a compact state space. Then we discussed the unbounded uh, state space. And then we discussed the rate of convergence. And the quantization of the state space will follow the same uh, reasoning, but I'll just spend maybe uh, a, few, a few more minutes on this particular slide 
but that will give us the construction of how we obtain a finite state space model. Okay. Now, given a state process, action process, and the control action set, a, a transition kernel, and, and, the, and the metric on our state space, what we define is this. We are going to be given a collection of points. We define our bins, which are going to be minimizing the distance from a nearest neighbor uh, uh, selection of our finite set. Because we apply a nearest neighbor quantizer. Because this is what we call a nearest neighbor quantizer in, in, in source coding theory. For every basically uh, ZMI, find the neighbors which will minimize this cost function. For example, it will, it will reduce to the Voronoi partitions in our uh, Euclidean space under the quadratic distortion measure. And then what we'll define is we'll define those bins which are defined in this fashion, basically, which map the set of actions, the set of state spaces, this, uh, the, the, uh, basically the, the set of points which belong to a particular bin, that defines our new point, and each of these bins will be a single point in our new state space. And given this point, we put a random a probability measure on this, on this uh, bin for every uh, such bin, and then we define an equivalent new artificially defined finite state model. Because this finite state model, what it does is the following. Given, let's say, given i, the i pin, say this is the j pin. And what you do is, uh, say this is the m pin. Basically, I'm trying to find the condition probability from going the i state to the m state. Then I put a random distribution on the state space for the i pin, look at the conditional distribution, define the push forward of this um, uh, conditional distribution, and this will be the new finite state uh, model. And we do the same for the cost model. Now we have a finite state model with a, with a well-defined cost function. And then the rest of the talk is all technicality. Given this model, now that I have defined a finite model, when is it that this finite model is going to represent the original model? How do I converge? And how, how fast do I converge? So basically, I'm just uh, getting the feedback from you guys that uh, probably I've made a mistake of including too many slides. Uh, we can just maybe given this big picture, uh, skip the technicalities, and uh, I can go to the, uh, the connection with information theory part. Now, we, we, we saw the basic big picture, we saw the construction, and uh, the next question is, given our analysis, how efficient is, is the algorithm? Now, let's define a quantizer, and define the rate of a quantizer as the, the log of the uh, cardinality of the range space. Suppose that our A is compact, and suppose that uh, uh, we, and we know that basically, if we live in the d-dimensional space, and if I have k uh, many uh, levels, k many bins in my quantizer, we know that there exists a quantizer which has the following cost function, which has the following approximation function, appro approximation error. So for example, if d is uh, equal to 1, if, are, if I'm quantizing the real space, let's say a single line, and if I use only k number of levels, we know that the maximum error is going to be inversely proportional by the number of quantizers, by, by the number of levels in my quantizer. But this also applies for an arbitrary uh, d-dimensional space, and it's going to be important in our, uh, in our analysis. Okay. And the rate that we use is basically the logarithm of the number of levels, which is k in this case. Okay. So this part should be clear, right? Basically, if I have a compact set in a d-dimensional space, if, I've, if I'm told that I can only use k many bins in my quantizer, there exists an encoder which is going to satisfy this property for a fixed lambda, independent of k. Okay. And now, basically, then you have the following, uh, some technical uh, assumptions that you impose in your system. Then, uh, again, some assumptions in your system. Then you can make sure that your approximation is going to scale as 1 over k to the power 1 over d. So basically, as k goes to infinity, the epsilon that you obtain is going to be inversely proportional to k to the power 1 over d. And the same discussion also is going to apply for the average cost. Okay. Basically, if, if, if the number of bins that you can have in your quantizer is going to be k, then you have the following bound. And in fact, you can also write this in the, in the form of a function which only depends on k, and this is also going to be basically in this form. And the same discussion also applies for state quantization. I'll just skip this. I'll just uh, skip this part. Okay. And uh, can we also obtain whether this is optimal or not? Imagine the following. Suppose I have the following source. 
And given this source, if I have k number of bins that I can use, you apply the sh what we call the Shannon Lauer bound. And if you apply the Shannon Lauer bound, you can show that this expression is the term which uh, arises in the Shannon Lauer bound. You can show that a Lauer bound on log 2 of k is given by this expression. And by putting this to the other side and uh, working with theta d of n, and recognizing that d of n is in the denominator, you, you show that basically the best that you can achieve under any encoding, under any quantizer policy, or any under any uh, causal encoding decoding policy is also going to have the same exponent. So basically, you're always going to be having the same loss if you have a finite rate. So in a way, the construction that we achieve, obtain is tight for systems which have this form. Okay, so, uh, and as we talked this morning with uh, Marcus and with Nuno, it's very important when you have a result to make sure that you can type up your result, write an algorithm, and make sure things uh, are, are big encodable in a computing language. Basically, our graduate student uh, worked very hard to, and he showed that basically for some useful problems, we can obtain such results. Okay. Like you can implement the scheme. You can implement the, uh, the, the, the construction is implementable in, in, a, in an efficient manner. Okay. So in this talk, basically, what we talk about is we try to basically at least uh, give the general uh, feel of what kind of problems are, uh, are there in the intersection of control theory and source coding theory, especially. And in the first part, we made the point that basically control theoretic ideas are very useful to obtain practically implementable and important uh, problems in uh, communication theory. In the second part of the talk, we also we made the point that basically using ideas from source coding and quantization can also be used for uh, a classical problem in obtaining approximate optimal uh, policies for uh, infinite dimensional Markov decision problems. Thank, Thank you. you very much.